Hello, my name is Ashley and welcome to this edition of Losing It With Sam and Ash Health Issues Edition. As I said, I'm Ashley and this is Sam from Losing It With Sam and Ash. First thing I need to ask, Sam, what's with the doctor's stethoscope and the nurse's costume? Um, well... I said, do you notice I said stethoscope? Stethoscope. Okay, what, what, for real though? What's um, what to get up? Well, actually, I stole this doctor's stethoscope from a doctor, That's and then I borrowed these pajamas. I bought them at like one of those scrub places. <laughs> no, for real. Um, I'm uh, I'm an RN uh, in the ICU, so this is actually my stethoscope. I did not steal this from a doctor. This is for real. Yeah, we bought this like with our own money. That's great. So and, you look like a doctor when you wear it. Uh, I don't know about that, but anyway. Um, this is my scrub top, but I'm not going to get into those issues. Okay, so what so is, so you are a registered nurse, yes, you work in an ICU, mm -hmm. now what's your background? What ended you up there? Okay, so I went to school for um, history and Spanish the first time when I kind of was a traditional student between 18 and 22. You're kind of dreamy, I'm just looking at you. <laughs> and. Uh, I decided um, to go back after being small business owners together um, that I wanted to get a nursing degree. Um, and so when I was like 30-ish, went back to school um, and got an associate's degree in nursing and then a bachelor's of science in nursing. Both of those, you know, as an adult student, uh, I did the bachelor's degree while I was working in that uh, ICU. So I have about three and a half to four years of ICU experience taking care of a variety of types of patients from septic shock to hemorrhagic um, and ischemic strokes to lung uh, patients with uh, lung uh, surgeries and major abdominal surgeries. It's kind of been floated around in different patients. Uh, tra I do trauma now also. so. A number and a big variety of, of different types of patients. Now you came from a background of no medical history. Not a lot of people in your family were in the medical history. I think you have mentioned that your family didn't even get sick a lot. Studied history and Spanish in school. So what did you first notice coming from kind of a very outsider's view when you first stepped into that hospital atmosphere? Honestly, I realized that my life was a little bit sheltered in that sense. Growing up with a family that was in ministry and education, I just hadn't been inside the hospital and I had never been a patient in the hospital. So it was kind of interesting because most nurses come from like they had some significant event in their life that made them like want to be a nurse. So I went in the hospital and I was very naive and I had not been in the hospital like hardly at all, um, especially outside of births. Um, and so I was shocked when I went to clinicals at the number of people that were in there um, in the hospital with totally preventable diseases or mostly preventable diseases, things that they had basically lived a lifestyle that promoted. So just shocked by the number of people in there from smoking, from being obese, and drugs and alcohol. I mean that that was two Those thirds to three, three quarters. Drugs yeah, and alcohol, absolutely. smoking and obesity and absolutely. Are, is like drugs and alcohol like a major reason or is that kind of like Yeah, oh yeah. Or? Oh there's all kinds of things to you. And um it appears your decision making we see mm -hmm. a lot of traumas that are drug and because alcohol related. Uh, the number one used to be smoking, um, and it's changing now to obesity. And you can even see that kind of shift. So what type of diseases specifically linked to obesity are you speaking of? Diabetes mm -hmm. and uh, vessel disease, so coronary artery disease and stroke, typically, especially ischemic stroke from high cholesterol. And so you're saying that these, these things, heart attacks and um, diabetes, that if people would get a handle on their weight, we don't like to talk about weight in America because we're just supposed to Their accept, percentage of body fat, let's Right, say percentage that. body yeah. fat, but we don't like to put that label because it seems very like PC, like non-PC, but what you're saying is we need to talk about it because yeah, we need to talk about it. that's why people are, Absolutely. you're treating them and they're in the hospital because yes. nobody's making a big enough deal about it. Yeah, everybody acts like it's normal. Mm. Um, that's the problem is that everybody sees it as normal. I mean, honestly, who 
who doesn't know somebody who's had open heart surgery? And so what, what, is this hopeless? And if not, what needs to be done? Is this a hopeless situation? It's not hopeless at all. In fact, I think that it's actually far more easily prevented than we realize. And uh, we spend so much money on drugs to fix the problem, medications, so much money on uh, finding a cure, and very little time, effort, energy, money, resources, thought, speaking of preventing mm -hmm. what's going on, um, which is far more cost efficient. It's far easier to prevent cancer from getting into your body than getting it out once it's in there, uh, let alone all these other issues. So to me, it's totally preventable, or not all of it's, all of illness isn't preventable, but much of it is preventable, and especially what we see in the hospital and in the United States. And so I think it starts by talking about it. And so if we were to just real quick to wrap this up, like make a quick action plan of, and I know I'm putting you on the spot, but a quick action plan of what somebody, I mean, anywhere from their teens, I'm guessing that most that are watching this are in their 30s and 40s, you know, getting close to middle age, but 20s, 30s, 40s. What right now can we do to stay out of your out of your room, out of your service? What can we be doing? Like top three to five things could we do? So everybody says diet and exercise, and you've heard that your whole life, and that of course is true. But obviously just saying that over and over again has done very little in our society to change anything. We have to realize that it's here, mm -hmm. that it's a mindset, that it's a mentality, and that we have to learn more about what we're eating, about how we're exercising, about coming up with something that will work for us. It's really about learning who you are, what works for you, but you have to get on that journey. You have to start trying things. And that's what I think we need to start doing is helping people to try things and be bold enough and brave enough to go, I'm going to try to eat this instead of that or cut out this, I'm going to wean myself off of this, I know it's not good for me and see what happens. Now how long you say, sorry I said we were done but one more no. question, when you say try things, mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of people just give up because they figure it's not working for me and right. I think a lot of times that's because they don't fully commit to what they're doing sure. so it's like oh, a little cheat here and a little cheat here and oh, I did three days off and this kind of thing. Right. So besides fully committing, is there kind of a length of time that you would say you need to fully 100% commit before you can say definitively, yes, this works for me or no, it's time to do something else and try something di different? I think it depends on what you're talking about. Um, I do think if you're going to commit to an exercise program, if that's what you're referring to, an exercise program, no and um, a better nutrition plan, I do think you have to give it like two to three months to really know, like, are we moving in the right direction? Now, I think there should be signs very early on. You should start feeling better. You should start start to see the scale move, although I'm not a big like fan of like the scale. I think how you feel and your measurements are really probably more important than what that scale number. I think we get so obsessed with the scale. We should be more obsessed with what is on the back of the of the um, food that we're eating than what the scale says. But so fitness versus nutrition. It, Obviously, they have to go hand in hand. Yeah. But if you were to say like one right now, 100% commit to one. Like I know they have to be both together. Well, it depends on what your problem is. So if, if your problem is that you're 60 pounds overweight, then you have to commit to the nutrition. You have to. You're going to have to lose some weight or you're going to put a lot of stress on your joints. So you need to lose some weight before you get into more active parts of um, physical activity. If you're talking about depression, anxiety, just kind of like not happy with your life, I say exercise. I think that's that, that, that endorphin release when you, when you exercise, it's way underrated in our society about how much that helps us. So. Uh, I think it all kind of depends, um, but if your goal is to lose weight, then you need to tweak something in your diet. If it's to lose a lot of weight, you need to think about long term, you're going to have to do more tweaks. Mm -hmm. I really believe that you should start small and just get like a, get momentum, get the ball rolling. 
and then just cut things out. So maybe you wean one thing for 21 days or something, two weeks or three weeks, and then you wean something else, and then you wean something else, and then you add some. And that's the other thing. You got to be obsessed with what you're adding in. You're gonna. I'm gonna add in these nutrients to mm. my diet instead of. I'm not gonna drink it. Just like a good and like drink a bad diet soda anymore. Think about. I'm gonna put these nutrients in my body so that I can perform better because I'm also working out every day or so I can pick up my children, so I can run with my children, so I can be a grandparent that can play with their kids when they're 60 and you're not going to the doctor twice a week and in and out of the hospital when you're just, just out, you know, just barely retired. This has been so interesting. So basically you're saying that most of your patients in the ICU in the whole hospital okay are there from obesity smoking drugs and alcohol related things that's kind of crazy because i think i would have assumed that it was random accidents and just like where did this come from disease so thank you so much i want to say thank you for being on this it was a pleasure to be here addition and thank you for joining us on Losing with Sam and Ash, Health Issues Edition. I'm Ash. I'm Sam. And we're losing it with Sam and Ash because we're almost losing it. Like I had, I see my kids trying to get in the refrigerator and jumping around downstairs. So we're going to have to go, but you can follow us at losingitwithsamandash.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can leave any comments or questions below. Also, you can follow us on facebook.com backslash losing it with Sam and Ash. And lastly, I love me some Instagram, but there I'm happy fit mama five with an underscore between each word. Thank you again. And I have a lot more I want to talk to you about Mr. I have a lot more to tell you. Mr. Wealth of Knowledge. Bye. See ya.